Uh, yeah. So basically, I have this view that is actually backed up by a lot of what uh, we saw today in the market and what we've been seeing of late. Um, global growth slowdown, right? Last week, the Fed came out and continued to pivot to a to a dovish stance. Basically, took interest rate hikes off the table for the duration of this year. And if you remember, you know, tail end of last year, investors were talking about three or four potential rate hikes this year. And now that the Fed has actually taken that off the table, investors are starting to think about a potential rate cut. Uh, at, at the back end of this year. That was followed on Friday by flash PMI data out of the Eurozone that hit a 71-month low. And the Fed came out and basically took down their, their GDP forecasts for 2019 and 2018 to 2.1% and 1.9% respectively. Now, Tom, you mentioned that we got GDP at 2.2% today versus 26 um we had previously been expecting, right? So you definitely have, I don't think anybody's going to deny that the current environment from an economic standpoint is growth slowing, right? Not contracting, but but slowing from the pace uh, that we had witnessed through 2000, 2017 and a lot of 2018. Now it started to slow down globally in 2018. The US was bucking that trend thanks to some stimulus and tax cuts. And now we have to lap those those tough comps. So naturally it makes sense that that growth is slowing down. And if we kind of go into kind of my thought on that and what my view is on that, um, falling rates, Tom, you alluded to that. I think that that's a trend that's likely to persist. But on the, I don't think it's necessarily outright bearish for the equity market. I just think it has to impact your positioning. And on the equity side of the equation, I, there are two key themes. Uh, number one, rate plays. Um, we've seen the outperformance of, of REITs and utilities uh, as rates have fallen. We've also seen the underperformance of financials as rates have fallen. But a bigger picture theme is that it, I think in a slowing growth world, investors will pay a premium for what is actually growing. You're quote unquote secular growers, right? And if you, Tom, look at the names that you were highlighting earlier, you know, Lululemon is a secular grower within the retail space. Uh, Five Below is a secular grower in the retail space, meaning these companies have the potential to buck the economic trend and continue to grow. And then the other one that you called out was Verint, VRNT, right? Software has been on fire, obviously. Um, a lot of secular growth within the software space. And then the one name that you pointed out that wasn't doing much today following their earnings announcement, Cynix, SNX. Well, for those of you who aren't familiar with what they do, I mean, they do they're what's known as a VAR, a value-added retailer. They basically distribute technology and you know, your, your office needs to buy and, and configure new hardware, a, a, a company like Cynix helps you with that. That is not secular growth. So the three names that you could apply the secular growth label to are all performing well, gapping higher today. And the one name that's not kind of going nowhere, kind of spinning its wheels. So I have this view that in a slowing growth environment, investors are going to pay a premium for growth. So just a you know, quick um, rundown on who I am. Uh, I'm been on the street for 19 years. I'm a chartered market technician. So I've taken the, the three exams that you have to pass to earn the CMT designation. And I am the co-chair of the New York chapter uh, of the CMT association, along with a couple of other really talented people. And prior to joining Cheek and Analytics a little over a year ago as their chief market strategist, I spent 10 years covering large institutional investors uh, from a from a sales and trading desk, right? So the, the firms that are out there upgrading and downgrading the stocks that Aaron was talking about. Um, you know, I worked with those analysts and my clients were hedge funds and mutual funds and pension funds, predominantly in New York and Connecticut with a kind of a scattering in, uh, in some other parts of the country. So that's uh, a little bit on my background. So I was just wondering, you know, kind of like, how are you positioned as global growth slows? I think that's kind of the conversation we need to be having with ourselves uh, as investors, right? The last time I was on, uh, I talked about relative strength and how important it is 
to my process and why it's really important to uh, to the process. So, you know, it, it, a lot of people like to come out and say, what do you think of the market? Do you think the market's going up well, or going down? You know, what have you? What's your view on the market? And, you know, while it's a, it's a good question, I don't always think it's the right question. I'm more interested in what's outperforming and what's underperforming. And as I think about how I want to structure a portfolio, I want to be positioned in the parts of the market that are outperforming and, and shy away from the parts that are that are underperforming. So just kind of bigger picture on the S&P 500. We talked about this a little bit, right? Short term metrics, relatively flat, long term metrics, relatively flat. And I think we're consolidating here kind of in this, you know, 2800 to 2850 range, just above a, a flat 200 day moving average. I realize it's a little bit crowded, but you know, the 200 day moving average down at 2755, roughly flat. So from a short term and long term perspective, the trends are flat. What's interesting to me and why I think the market will ultimately resolve to the upside is that as we've kind of consolidated here and gone sideways, the RSI has held above 50. If you notice when the market was was weak, the RSI, you know, routinely became oversold. And on the rallies, the RSI, you know, would have a hard time getting much above the 50 level, right? The opposite is true now, similar to what we saw before the market topped out in the fall. When the RSI is able to kind of become overbought and then doesn't really fall much back below the, the 40 or 50 level, that tells me that the momentum is bullish and that you want to use pullbacks to support in the market to identify your strong stocks in your in your strong industry groups and you know we we have a, a model that that rates stocks it's a 20 factor model right so i want to be looking for the, the stocks that we rank very bullish and bullish when they pull you know that are outperforming the market when the market pulls back and tests and and holds support so that's kind of my view bigger picture right now um but again not everything is created equal I think you want to skew towards the large cap side of the spectrum because small caps uh, are underperforming. You know, Tom, you brought up some relative charts. I love relative work. I don't look at anything without looking at it on a relative basis. So if we take a look at the IWM, the iShares Russell 2000 ETF, right? Notice that the difference here, right? We're still below the 200 day moving average. You've got some resistance up here around the 160 level RSI. The opposite of what we saw in the S and P 500 here, breaking down below that 50 level and kind of trending lower. And just at the bottom of the page, you can see a clear downtrend for the IWM relative to the S and P 500. So it's kind of step one as I'm thinking about names that look compelling to me. You know, I'm more likely to skew towards the large cap side um, of the market and and kind of avoid the small cap side of the market while this relative trend is in place. Breath, breath is one of the things that I'm pointing to that actually calls for us to resolve to the upside. The percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 currently trading above their 200 day moving averages is at about 56%. And this chart is as of yesterday, it might've down ticked a little bit yesterday, uh, but it's still above 50%. And if you notice, we're above those interim highs from back in the, back in the fall. That to me bodes well for the market because if I look at how the market tends to perform over the next six months when this metric is above 50%, and this is data going back to 2010, um, markets higher six months later, 85% of the time since when, the, when this metric is over 50% for a median return of about 6.24%. So there's some statistical evidence based on market breadth that argues for a resolution to the upside. Is it guaranteed? Absolutely not, but you know, base rates matter and, uh, and we're paying attention to them. And at the same time, investor positioning is bullish. And I say that, I should say it's contrarianly bullish. Uh, this is data out of Merrill Lynch. Last week, they performed their global fund managers survey and what it showed is that global equity allocation, so allocations to equities as opposed to other asset classes, fell to their lowest percentage overweight since 2016. So when you hear the phrase, you know, there's dry powder on the sidelines, or right, or there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. Well, here here's a graphical representation of that. So I think that 
as investors kind of increase their overweight to equities, uh, that could be a tailwind for the market here, pushing up and out. But obviously, we want to be positioned in the right way. The other big story, Tom, you touched on it. You had a great you had a great chart in there, looking uh, at the U.S. versus Germany. Uh, here's just the the you know the ten year the ten year Treasury breaking below support at the two point four percent level. Uh, below the 50-day moving average, below the 200-day moving average, both of those uh, heading lower. And again, if we look at momentum in the same way, look at the RSI here, routinely becoming oversold and on rallies can't get much above that 50 level. So there's downside momentum to this to this move in yields, which leads me, we've been, you know, for those of you who listen to my morning show every day that airs on stock charts at 9.15, You've heard me say for a while, I think that the path of the least resistance for yields is lower. So that's beginning to play out. Now, we are a bit oversold in terms of yields, overbought in terms of the price of the bonds. So a, uh, a little bit of a, a retracement move can't be ruled out. But I think ultimately, from a trend perspective, uh, the path of least resistance for yields remains lower. And Tom, you talked about Germany. I'll take it, I'll take it a couple of steps further for... You know, I asked the question, is there room to fall for yields in the U.S.? And if we look at places like Japan and Germany, yields are actually negative. These are the 10-year yields for Japan, uh, Germany, Great Britain, Australia, and the U.S. And you, if you look on a relative basis, we're still above those other four major markets. So as investors globally search for yield, there's a relative component uh, to this play here, and you know, you can make the case that uh, investors will continue to bid up uh, our our treasuries, especially relative to some of these other developed markets. So globally, uh, paints a picture for the potential for yields to fall further. So as I said, we favor growth in a slowing growth world. So the an ETF, you know, for those of you who who trade strictly ETFs, an ETF that plays on that theme is the iShares S and P 500 growth ETF. So if you think about what we're talking about here, we're talking about large cap growth, right? You know, kind of clear clear uptrend off those December lows. We've cleared these interim highs here, and again, if we look at momentum, momentum you know becomes overbought, and on the pullbacks doesn't really get much below or below 50 at all. So momentum is behind this move, and you can see on a relative basis, we've broken up and out of a consolidation pattern when we look at growth relative to the, to the broader market. So in a slowing growth environment, we favor growth, and then here's just the complete opposite spectrum. We talked about small caps. Here's small cap value just you know below a declining 200-day moving average, bearish momentum, and a, and a clear downtrend relative to the broader market. So that's kind of a big picture, kind of top-down view of how I think of equity positioning. And now, Tom, you showed that chart that could potentially bode for bearishness for the dollar. That was a great chart, U.S. Uh, yield spread relative to, uh, to German 10 years and what that could potentially mean for the dollar. And if that starts to play out, like it looks like it might, uh, I think a weakening dollar has bullish implications for gold, and I, I don't think that's a very popular view. I don't see a lot of people talking about gold right now, but you know we've had a nice move off the lows, and we're consolidating here a bit. But momentum is uh, trying to shift to uh, to to bullish ranges, some some higher lows in the RSI, and you can see gold relative to the S and P 500 down here holding above support. So I think that you know. Adding adding some gold exposure uh, is is not a bad idea, and it's certainly not a crowded long idea, at least not based on anything that I'm reading and seeing. And then finally, I like to pay attention to sentiment. Uh, this is the CNN Fear Greed Index, and it's currently on a neutral rating. You know, back around Christmas Eve, when the market was making lows around 2350. This reading got to about a two. I don't think I've ever seen it that low. And you know, sometimes we get to you know points of extreme greed. So those are contrarian signals. Right now, kind of right in the middle of the middle of the range. So call it neutral. So you know, despite this big move that we've had from the December lows, uh, sentiment is not wildly greedy or exuberant to the point that would make me sit up and want to take a contrarian view. And 
you know, they asked the question here, what emotion is driving the market? I don't think that's the right question because at the end of the day, our view and our belief and what drives everything that we do is that fundamentals drive the market and emotions drive the market to extremes. And, you know, the best way to take advantage of that is a combination of fundamentals and technicals and to really just try as hard as you can to take your emotions out of the equation. And the way that we do that is with our power gauge rating. I said earlier, you know, we have this rating for, you know, over 4,000 US listed equities. It runs from very bullish to very bearish. You know, over time, both the back test and out of sample, our very bullish and bullish stocks out tend to outperform the market. Our bearish and very bearish stocks underperform the market. So just knowing you know what the rating is and skewing your long ideas to the to the bullish and very bullish stocks really gives you uh, a directional edge i like to refer to it as uh, as as your gps for the market and what it does is it takes the factors that have been proven over time to drive stock performance and you know these are the the factors that my former clients you know professional money managers were looking at on a daily basis we look at we look at the financials right this is kind of valuation and balance sheet type work. We look at earnings, obviously, because earnings are very important to the fundamental story. But more importantly, are the earnings growing? Are companies surprising to the upside, right? Stocks like Lululemon don't gap up the way they do unless they surprise to the upside, right? So, and those surprises tend to come in bunches. Then we look at the earnings trend. Are they, it was earnings growing or, or earnings contracting? Obviously, we care about valuation. And, but also, and I would say almost argue more importantly is how consistent is the company at meeting or beating expectations? We look at technicals. A lot of that has to do with relative strength and trend work. And then our kind of secret sauce is what we call experts. We're looking at what those analysts are doing with their ratings, what investors are doing, right? Is the short interest high or low, what the insiders are doing. And we roll up these 20 factors to kick out a rating that's a reliable indicator of a, of a stock's potential, right? And the reason we use models, again, the, the word emotion always comes to mind. And I love this quote from uh, Jim O'Shaughnessy. He runs O'Shaughnessy Asset Management uh, in Connecticut. Models beat human forecasters because they reliably and consistently apply the same criteria as opposed to human beings who are swayed by emotions and opinions, right? Think about how you felt in December when the market was trading, uh, you know, down 20% from the highs, right? Taking those emotions out of the equations is, is one of the keys to investment success. And it's, you know, one of Jim O'Shaughnessy's other quotes that I wish I could find a slide for, uh, but I haven't been able to yet is arbitraging human behavior will always be a sustainable investment advantage. And I really believe that as much as possible, we, we are emotional uh, creatures and especially when it comes to money and that sways our decisions. So having an unbiased model is really, really helpful in mitigating some of the emotional biases that we have. So our model kind of works from the top down, or at least that's how I view the world. So I start, you know, we started with our view on the market. And once we have that view on the market, we want to look for the sectors and industry groups that are likely to outperform and are currently outperforming, right? So what we can do is we can look at the different sectors and look within each sector to see how many stocks within our model currently have a bullish rating, a neutral rating, or a bearish rating. And we know that you know the fundamentals are driving that, and then we look at relative strength. So utilities are at the top of the list. They've been at the top of the list for a while. Healthcare and financials have solid fundamentals, but are currently underperforming the market. So we're kind of skewing away from those groups. I don't think that it makes sense to be outright bearish because the fundamentals are strong, but it doesn't make sense to be aggressive on the long side in those groups because the relative strength, what I really dove in on the last time I was here, uh, is just not there. These groups are underperforming. Tech and real estate round out the list of groups that have these this bullish ratio and the ratio is stronger than that of the S&P 500. And you can see the bottom of the list, energy, materials, you know, consumer discretionary uh, at the bottom of the list. And we can do the same analysis at the sector level, at the uh, sub-industry group level to kind of get more granular if we choose to do that. So that power gauge rating really drives everything that we do. So we talked about tech. Technology as a market leader makes sense if you buy my thesis that investors will pay a premium for growth, right? When you think about growth, you think about 
you know, the first thing that probably comes to mind is technology. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually rating ETFs as well. So we're applying that ratio that I just showed you, the percentage of bullish stocks to bearish stocks to a technical overlay to come up with a, a rating for, for the ETF. So we can see tech is, uh, you know, basically broken through resistance, now support at the $72 level. And here's that measure of relative strength. We've turned relative strength into an oscillator. And when it's kind of above, above 50 and it turns green, we know that it's outperforming. Obviously, everybody knows Mark Chaikin for, for the Chaikin money flow indicator. So we look at that. So when I see a group that's outperforming with, with bullish money flow and has a bullish rating, I know I want to be skewing to that side of the market. And within tech, software, Verint, you talked about it. Uh, software has been, been outperforming. This is the IGV uh, proxy for the software group. And you can see up here, this, this ETF has a very bullish rating, strong outperformance, strong money flow. So I know when I'm looking at the individual stock level that, you know, within tech, I want to be looking for ideas in the software space like, like Workiva, ticker is WK. Uh, they have a bullish rating in our model. And, you know, if you're, if, you know, for your users who are using stockcharts.com, I love the scooter uh, for getting a gauge of relative, uh, relative strength. But you can just see here a clear uptrend for a secular grower outperforming the market with bullish money flow with the kicker being you can feel confident owning a name like this because our rating on it is bullish as well. Same with a name like ACI worldwide, right? Steady uptrend above the 200 day moving average, strong scooter rating, bullish, uh, bullish check in money flow has a bullish rating within our model. So those are two names that I like uh, on the long side uh, in, in a leading part of the market. And both of these names are outperforming the market. Now, we talked about utilities, right? So the second part of my theme is number one, pay up for growth. Number two, yield plays likely continue to outperform. Utilities are boring, right? Now, who wants to talk about utilities? Uh, I certainly don't like talking about it, but you know, I, I talk about what's working. Uh, utilities are working. They e XLU has a very bullish ETF rating. It's been outperforming the market since October. Just mounds of green money flow, so investors are, you know, investors are buying the product. You have a nice breakout here through the fifty-seven dollar level. It was retested and held, and now continuing to uh, to work higher from a trend perspective. So I like the utilities. You know, if you want to play exposure to that through the XLU, as long as it's above fifty-seven dollars, I think it looks compelling. At the individual stock level, names like Excel Energy. Right, steady uptrend above a rising 200 day moving average, strong scooter, strong shake in money flow. It's a name that looks, you know, just a name that looks compelling uh, to the long side of the portfolio. And again, I said we favor growth in a slowing growth world. I mean, Amazon jumps out at me, and I'm, you know, I know it's, I don't, I like to talk about things that are different and not on everyone's radar, but the reason that Amazon jumps out at me is because. The way our model is structured, Amazon very rarely has a buy rating, uh, just because it tends to trade expensive. You know, I said there's a valuation component to the model, and you know, for those of you who who look at PE ratios, if at all, you'll notice that Amazon always trades at a ridiculously high PE ratio. But our model recently turned bullish on Amazon, which is encouraging because it lines up with the technical picture uh, that we're seeing here. You can see Amazon coming up and out of uh, of the recent consolidation. Uh, Scooter is improving. You know, institutional investors are buying the stock. Cheek and money flow uh, been persistently bullish throughout 2019. So that's that's pretty compelling to uh, to me. Uh, and the fact that it's backed up by our model turning bullish really gives me uh, conviction in a name like Amazon. On the flip side, in a slowing growth environment, material is likely to struggle. You can see here that the XLB has a neutral rating. Uh, I've, I've boxed off the relative strength because it's underperforming. If you look, money flow is now turning bearish. So that's a group that we want to avoid. Uh, our model is very bearish on a name like CF and you know, you can combine the technicals and the fundamentals, right? You have a stock trading below its 200-day moving average, a, a weak scooter score, uh, check in money flow persistently bearish since uh, since October. So obviously a name or type of name that you that you want to avoid, 
financials, we talked about them, right? I showed you that ratio where financials were near the top of the list, but here's what I mean. Underperforming the market, so it's really hard to get excited. And to the extent that yields continue to trend lower, financials are likely to remain an underperforming area of the market. We recently called out CME Group uh, as, a, as a bearish idea, and you can see it here from a technical perspective, and it's backed up by the fact that it has a bearish rating in our model. But really rolling over here, below the 200 day moving average scooter right so relative strength just really deteriorating and shaking money flow uh turning intensely bearish cme type of name that we don't want to own in this environment transports another economically sensitive part of the market in a slowing growth environment if we look at the iyt this this fund has a very bearish rating in our etf model you can see clearly it's underperforming the market and money flow is starting to go starting to go uh, bearish. So I recently called out Delta Airlines uh, for, for a bearish trade. And you just kind of, again, has a bearish rating in our model and does not look good technically. Breaking down through this, through this short-term uptrend line, scooter score showing the underperformance and shaken money flow, uh, you know, turning, turning intensely bearish again. So Delta Airlines is a name that I would, you know, at the very least avoid or for investors who do trade to the bearish side, potentially look at uh, at ideas there. So the Chaikin Power Gauge, again, is a simple but powerful tool. It's our GPS for the market. It drives everything that we do. We actually have a product, our Power Pulse product, uh, that we're offering as a special here for stockcharts.com members, you know, so where you can kind of get the harness, harness the power of the Power Gauge rating, right? So here's Amazon. Right, we looked at the technical picture, but how great is it to know that it also has a bullish rating to back up what you're seeing in the technicals? And this is you know, a screenshot from that product. You can see the model just recently turned bullish. Money flow has been positive, and it's actually just recently begun to outperform the market. So rolling it all up, you know, Amazon, a name like Amazon definitely looks compelling. And in addition to that, you know, our Power Pulse users can look at watch lists, right? And personalized portfolio monitoring so you can get up to date changes uh, on the names that you're looking at. The analysis is done for you. The power gauge rating updates every night. And then every week on Sundays, you get Mark Chaikin's weekly market commentary kind of set you up with everything that you need for the week ahead. And sometimes I fill in for Mark and, and write that note as well. So that's a lot of fun. And you know what we're doing is, uh, you know, we want to offer it here. Uh, you can try it for $9.99 for the first month. Uh, after that, it's uh, $24.95 a month. You can cancel any time. But if you head over to chakenanalytics.com forward slash stock charts, you can take advantage uh, of this uh, of this offer for uh, stock charts members. And that's kind of it for, for now. I'd love to stick around for questions. I love questions. And uh, Tom and Aaron, I'll kick it back to you. All right. Well, you do have a couple of questions here. Uh, Great. Tell you what, before we get into the poll, I'll go ahead and, and share my charts and show you what the questions are. Um, so here is the transports. Yep. Um, the question that came in is, uh, do the transports remaining below the 200 day moving average present a bearish indication longer term? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think so. Right. I, you know, a lot of people like to have the debate on whether or not the 200 day moving average is support and resistance. And, you know, I don't, I don't have a strong view there. There are times where moving averages clearly act as support and resistance and there are times when they don't but to me they're a measure of long-term trend right especially the 200 day moving average right so the fact that the transports are below their 200 day moving average it, it, it's hard for me to be bullish on them in that environment and i would rather skew to the bearish side so again the technical setup is bearish and it's confirmed by the fact that when i look at an etf right like like iyt that has a bearish rating. Well, what is that bearish rating telling me? It's telling me number one, that the trend is bearish, right? Because the trend is a big component in that rating, but drill down. It's telling me that the constituents within that fund, the fundamentals are skewed to the bearish side as well. So when I can back up what I'm seeing in the trends with a, with a fundamental picture that confirms it, that just gives me more conviction. So the fact that it's below the 200 day moving average is, is certainly not bullish. Um, and the fact that the fundamentals don't look compelling, excuse me, to the bearish side. Okay. 
Yeah, I would just also throw in there. I mean, it really depends on what part of the transport you're looking at. I mean, if you pull up the railroads, railroads, which, you know, all they do is ship goods in North America. So if they're if the market is is treating them better on a relative basis, I would think that that paints a better economic picture than, say, for the airlines, which obviously are much more volatile, dependent on oil prices, dependent on, uh, you know, um, consumer traffic as well as business traffic. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into the airlines, whereas I think the railroads are pretty, I, I don't know, for me anyway, they're more straightforward. And you can the railroads see- are more straightforward. It's one of the reasons I like to take my analysis a step further. When I showed you those uh, those power bar ratios, right? I start at the sector level just to get a big picture understanding of what sectors are leading and what sectors are lagging. But I always like to drill down from there, right? Because some sectors are really really broad, right? You know, if you take a if you take a sector like consumer discretionary, well, there are eight or more subsectors or industry groups within consumer discretionary, right? Home builders are part of consumer discretionary. Internet retail is part of consumer discretionary. Um, specialty retail, like the names that you were talking about, like Five Below and Lululemon, those are all separate industry uh, industry groups within the sector. So yes, I always think you should take your analysis a step further. Okay, cool. Um, the next question that came up was, are you concerned on a weekly basis? We talked about the RSI on the daily charts, but here on the weekly chart, you can see the S&P 500 has not been able to get above 60 on the RSI, the weekly RSI. Does that bother you? Well, it's a little slower moving. So what I'm kind of, you know, obviously I want to see it continue to move higher. Um, But if you look uh, on the pullback, I guess it's about three weeks ago now, um, it actually held above 50. So on a longer term time frame, it is a little bit of a a mixed bag, but it kind of lines up with what we were talking about, right? The 200 day moving average is flat. Um, we've had this intermediate, intermediate term run from December, right? So that's obviously bullish. So when I'm looking at things on a daily time frame, they're going to be a little bit more sensitive. Uh, over time, I would expect that as the daily RSI remains above 50 and continues to become over, overbought, the, I would expect to see the weekly begin to trend higher as well. Okay. Um, one other thought there that I'll add too. I, I pulled this up. This is a weekly S and P 500 chart back from 2000 to 2009, where we had two secular bear markets. And during those bear markets, right here, you can see the huge drops. We never saw the weekly PPO go back above zero. Never. Once we went above zero, the bear market was behind us. If we go back to this chart now, the PPO went negative back in the fourth quarter of last year. We have turned positive. Now, I'm almost positive that we didn't have any problems either in the cyclical bear markets of 1991 and 1998 as well. So this is another indication. I mean, usually you get bear market rallies, but they don't tend to last long enough for you to get that PPO to cross back over into positive territory. And it's been there now for almost a month. So I think that I kind of agree with you, Dan. I think that the the majority of the signals are pointing to a continuation of the rally. Um, right. And I, it's just a function of where, how do you want to be positioned? Right. Because he, I always look at relative strength. So while I believe that the quote unquote market is likely to go higher, I, I want to try as best as possible to position our clients or steer our clients towards, towards outperformance. Right. Because at the end of the day, we, we want to try to beat the market. Right. Right. All right, just two more questions, and then we'll let you go and get on with your day. Uh, Amazon, I just pointed, pulled up on the chart because you were talking about it, but one of the questions was, um, would you or do you buy the stocks you recommend? So in other words, are you following those, those charts and buying those stocks? Not always, because I recommend stocks every day. I write a daily note where the, you know, there's stocks, you know, where there's stock ideas. Uh, my higher conviction ideas... Uh, um, I do. I actually, I own Amazon in a retirement account because I do think Amazon's a secular grower. So I, I don't own it in a trading account. I basically own it in an account that I hardly ever look at. Um, I actually, I like to own things that are kind of a hedge on my life, right? So just to give you like, so when, you know, there's three Amazon packages a day on my front steps, I kind of want to own Amazon as a, as a hedge on my life. I own Starbucks for the same reason. And Verizon, for that matter. Yep, yep. 
I get it. All right, final question. Um, how are your Power Pulse charts different from the Chaikin Analytics Suite? Does it have a search function? You can type in ticker symbols and and, and get the charts, but they're they're just there's you, they're not a ton different. They're just presented graphically different. You you get price trend. It's a line chart instead of a candlestick chart, so it's it's close only data. But you you can see what the power gauge rating is. You can see what relative strength is, and you can see um, power gauge rating, line chart, relative strength. And you, what you're missing is our um, our bands. You know, Mark Mark created um, uh, something similar to Bollinger bands uh, that are on the full suite that are not on um, the Power Pulse product. Okay. To me, like uh, to me, the 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 way I would envision using Power Pulse would be in conjunction with StockCharts.com. Right, you're doing your technical analysis. You're on Stock Charts. Because you know, because it's a it's a great platform for technical analysis. And then once you've identified these names that look good technically, if you can get the reassurance that this stock also has a a bullish or very bullish rating with an hour model, that that serves as extra conviction to your idea. Mm -hmm. Further confirmation, I like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, here is the poll um, that we put up on the screen. So, as a very straightforward question, are you concerned about economic glo global growth slowing? And three quarters of the respondents have said yes. Um, right. So that's, I mean, it makes sense. I think the takeaway here is just because growth is slowing doesn't mean the market can't work higher, but you want to be positioned properly. So I hope I kind of hit that home, right? You know, I, you, I don't think you want to be heavily in transports or materials. I think you want to be skewed towards a secular growth and B, the parts of the market that are going to benefit from further decline in rates, especially in light of the fact that, I mean, rates in Germany and Japan are negative. It's mm. crazy. Yeah. Well, a couple points there. I mean, first of all, I would answer this yes. I didn't answer, but I would definitely answer yes. I mean, you've got to be concerned about economic gro uh, global growth slowing. Um, Aaron, you want to chime yes. in on that? Yes. <laughs> yes. I pay attention to all of it. You know what I mean? You have to. There, there's no way to just ignore what's going on globally. You know, it has to, it has to affect your, your vision and, and what you're looking at in the market in general. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Which kind of gets back to the, the point that I made, you know, it's, it's, if you think, I mean, you can look at economic data as fundamental data, similar to you, what you would look at for a company's fundamentals. And it really is, you know, combining the two is going to give you, the highest likelihood of success. And, and listen, I am, I'm a CMT, right? Chartered market technician. I, I, my process starts with technicals, but you know, I believe in, in fundamentals, right? I spent 10 years covering institutional investors. They are predominantly fundamental investors, right? None of those investors are going to buy or sell a stock based strictly on the technicals. There has to be a fundamental underpinning to what they're doing. And, and I mean, I firmly believe that because at the end of the day, you know, all else being equal, if I'm looking at two stocks that are that are in uptrends, I'd rather own the name that has solid fundamentals behind it. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. And one final thought, because we got to run here, but one final thought, and this is an old Wall Street adage: don't fight the Fed. We got Fed, we got central banks in Europe that are very dovish right now, trying to get you know kickstart growth, and you've got a Fed here in the U.S. that was turning more hawkish in the fourth quarter. You saw what happened to the stock market. And now all of a sudden those rate hikes are out of the forecast and they're becoming much more dovish again. So for those who think, okay, well, if economic strength is, is slowing, we're in trouble in the market, I would argue that you don't want to fight the Fed. No, I, I would agree with that. The Fed sounds, the Fed got the market's message. No doubt about it. Dan, always a pleasure to have you on here. Really enjoyed your presentation today and we look forward to having you back soon. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for taking the time to listen.
With three unique service levels and multiple data plans to choose from, StockCharts.com makes it easy to customize your account to best match your specific needs. In this video, we'll help you explore all the benefits of your membership by explaining our service levels, data plans, and pricing. Let's see how it works. To start, you'll want to choose from one of our three service levels, Basic, Extra, or Pro. Each service level represents a collection of features and options bundled together. If you're new to stock charts, our basic service level is a great place to start. At $14.95 per month, basic will allow you to create larger, more powerful charts and save them to your account. Next up is our extra service level, the most popular choice among stock charts users. At $24.95 per month, it includes all the features of our basic level, plus more saved chart storage and the ability to create custom scans and alerts. If you want it all, our Pro service level is for you. At only $39.95 per month, Pro includes even more storage for your saved charts, custom scans and alerts, as well as faster auto refresh, historical data, and much more. For all service levels, you can choose to subscribe on either a monthly or an annual basis. Our monthly renewal option is similar to most other web-based subscription services. You pay for one month of service at a time, and your account will simply renew automatically each month. With our annual renewal option, you prepay for 12 months of service and we'll give you the 13th month for free. If at any point you'd like to change your service level or renewal preferences, you can always do so from the Your Account page. Now that you've chosen a service level, let's find a data plan that works best for you. Regardless of service level, all Stock Charts accounts come standard with our free data plan, which uses BAT's real-time data for the U.S. and delayed data for all other markets. However, if you want to enhance your Stock Charts experience even more, you can customize your account by adding official real-time data plans for one or more of the stock exchanges we support. Similar to exchange fees, prices for each plan vary, as they reflect the fees charged by the exchanges for your use of the real-time data. We want to make sure you have the data that's right for you, so our data plans are flexible and can be added or removed at any time. Keep in mind that all real-time data plans are billed separately from your service level subscription and always on a monthly basis. Unless removed from your account, data plans renew automatically at the end of each billing month. If you do choose to remove a plan, the change will take effect at the end of the month. All data plan charges are non-refundable. To explore all our data plans and update your preferences, visit the Your Account page. StockCharts.com gives you the charting tools and resources you need to invest smarter. And now with the flexibility to customize your service level, renewal cycle, and data plans, we make it easy to find the account options that are just right for you. Take control of your investing in just a few simple clicks with StockCharts.com, simply the web's best financial charts. So in the book itself, just so everybody knows, it's all stock charts, charts, it's all stock charts, um, setups, but I talk about why to use candlestick charts, why you might want to use line charts, bar charts, um, mountain charts, like you'd see on the uh, business news networks and those kind of channels. A lot of it is about the settings in stock charts and how to make great charts. This is actually a book about building your base, understanding how to make the chart display the information you want, all of the little trick settings. It, I think it came out pretty well. So in the book, what I try to do is show, um, you know, how to get things set up uh, specifically about uh, overlays and indicators, how to turn them on, how to change the settings, how to make them show up the way you want them to. And so if you're struggling with any of the sort of chart settings, that's an important part. Uh, with that, thanks everybody.
Here's how to put a simple line on your chart without using the annotation tool. Let's say we want a line in here at 4750. You can just drop down here into the overlays, pick horizontal line, add the price point 47.5 and we're going to use a red line. We're going to make it solid and thick and hit update and that blasts it into the middle of your chart.